Hey, just wanted to thank you for tuning into the stream. My name is Casey. Uh, I just want to let you know service is going to start here in a few minutes. Uh, but before it starts, we're going to have some announcements, different things going on here at BCLG that will be rotating on the stream this morning. Make sure you take note of those. Also, if you've never joined us in person here at Burtport Church of God, we would love for you to do that, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks. Well, praise the Lord. Here it is, Lord, it's yours. I surrender all. All to you I surrender. I'm holding nothing back. I want your best in my life, God. I want all that you have in my life. I surrender. This is my surrender. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. That's a big prayer, guys. That's a big prayer. Amen. You may be seated today. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. We want to welcome everyone that is in the house, everyone that is joining us online. And at this time, our Genesis kids can be dismissed. And as they walk out of the sanctuary today into their uh, kids' church, keep them in prayer. Amen. We want to do our very best to invest in the next generation that's coming up. Amen? Because uh, some of them that we're walking out of here, Sunday school teachers, worship leaders, some of them are evangelists, some of them are pastors. We just don't know it yet. They don't know it yet. But there's a call that God's going to have on their life. Amen? And man, praise God, the devil's not going to get them. Lay the blood of Jesus over their lives. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Again, we're so glad to have you. We're going to continue our series uh, entitled The Empowered Life. And I don't want you to lose that. I want you to hang on to it. The Empowered Life. Uh, the first message that we looked at is the power of focus. And in all reality, we just crossed the threshold of that message, devoting ourselves to the first point. Again, the power of focus, the power of focus, and this is the, the first point of focus that we need to have, focusing inward where I am honest with myself and with God. We're not going anywhere until we are, first of all, honest within ourselves and honest with our God. Amen? That's where it's got to start. we got to be healthy in us and healthy in our relationship with God before anything else is going to be healthy in our lives. Amen. Amen. See, what happens to most of us is uh, as Christ followers, we, uh, we get busy doing church stuff and, and we neglect the inner person. Uh, to get full proficiency and durability from your vehicle, uh, it will require regularly scheduled checkups and maintenance. Why do we think any less in our spiritual life? We need those regularly scheduled times where we set ourselves aside to be alone with God and say, God, examine me. Look in me. See if there's any unclean. Amen. Amen. It's those moments that we will reach the highest proficiency and greatest durability when we're honest with ourselves and with God. Now, I want to suggest to you, and I'll have them on the screen, I want to suggest to you some questions that you can use when you're in your time of meditation, reflection, and examination. Now, I hope I don't upset anybody, but somebody's looking at me and saying, I don't know what you're talking about, because <laughs> you've never taken the time. I want to encourage you, don't continue down that path. Stop. Stop where you're at right now, and start scheduling those times where you meditate and you uh, reflect and you uh, not only do self-examination, but open yourself to God's examination in your life. Amen. So first question I want you to consider is this. Do I truly strive to live my life as Jesus lived His? Amen. Do I... Truly, is that my highest goal, to live 
like Jesus did. Amen. In all my actions and all my reactions. Now, I got to stop right there and I got to say, okay, I need some help, guys. Many times I can get the actions down, but sometimes it's the reactions that hang me up. Am I okay today? So I need to stop and ask myself, am I really working, striving, endeavoring to live like Jesus? Second question, and there's uh, three. Is God my first love? Is God my first love? And to do, go along with that, do I do things to demonstrate my love for Him? If so, what? Make a list. Am I okay today? Amen. Is he? Or are there other things that have edged him out to the peripheral of my life? Is he my first love? Am I doing the things that demonstrate it? If so, make a list. Third question. Am I living in a way that will leave a legacy of faith? I want to leave something that transcends my life. I want to leave a legacy of faith that others can continue to build on. Amen. And the fourth, final question is this. Am I closer in my relationship with God today than I was last year or 10 years ago? I think these are legitimate questions that we need to ask ourselves. Am I growing in my relationship and connection with the Lord? Am I uh, uh, closer to Him today? And is my relationship stronger today than it was last year? Ten years ago, these are not to, to uh, bring criticism in any way. It's about examination where we can take note and begin to grow. Amen. Now, that should be enough to get us started. See, the idea is to be real with our inner self. It's to get it out... Uh, all out on the table with God. To begin working on those areas where we find the need for improvement. Any relationship that you're in that's worth having that re relationship is worth the investment of making that relationship better. Amen. Amen. See, when I seriously focus on the inner person, I find that my vision becomes clearer, allowing me to serve God in, a, in an e eternally satisfying way. He's my fulfillment. He's my, he's my life. Amen. Amen. So that leads us to the second point in this message, and it's this. Focus upward where I acknowledge God's role in the process. Anthony said it the last two weeks, I believe, when he has opened our service. We can't do life without him. I need him. Actively involved in my life. I need to acknowledge God's role. Listen, when I was a kid, especially when I got to go to uh, grandma and grandpa's that lived just upside, uh, outside of Effingham, Illinois. They, they lived in this huge house. It was a playground in and of itself. But if that wasn't enough, it had a school playground right on the other side of their driveway. I mean, I go over there and play on the swings, and I mean, that's when they had slides. I mean, slides. <laughs> I mean, that you climb stairs. You thought it was the stairway to heaven. And they had the, uh-huh, fun. But you know what I really, really enjoyed? I, and there was a kid that would always show up when I was out there, a kid bigger than I was, a kid faster than I was. I loved riding the merry-go-round. 
the kind where someone runs alongside and makes you go faster and faster and faster. Now, if you've ever ridden one of these, you probably discovered that to experience the maximum G-force, you had to sit out and hold on close to the edge. But if you move closer to the center of the merry-go-round, the more stable the ride becomes. Amen. Now, th th that's a, an important principle. See, the faster your life goes, the more focused you must be on your center if you're going to survive and thrive. Amen. And what, listen, and what or who is the center of your life? makes all the difference in surviving life. Amen. Listen, it's not your family. Your family is not the center of your life. Your career is not the center of your life. And it shouldn't be your golf game. <laughs> Some of you are ready to get off that ride. It shouldn't, and here we are in the playoff, it shouldn't be your favorite football team. That shouldn't be the center of your life. The center of your life has got to be God. Now, what we need to do is center ourselves by keeping our focus on God's role uh, in the process of developing us throughout our lives. We need that upward focus. Now, we're going to read out of Philippians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 3 through 6, and I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said. He said, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. When I think of you, I thank God for you. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And listen, and I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue His work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. The work he started, he's going to continue, and it won't culminate until Christ comes back. Hallelujah. Look at somebody and say, he's still working on me. Somebody needs to be thanking God. He's still working. You need to acknowledge God in the process. Listen, even though much of Paul's focus here is on the Christians in Philippi. Everything he says about them or himself is centered in his focus on God and God's role in the process. Paul's personal powerful confidence was centered in the goodness of God. I acknowledge God's role in the process and I can trust the God that's working the process. Amen. Look at what he said again. Every time, we got it on the screen, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. When I think of you, I thank God for you. Draws God into the equation. Amen. The focus is on God. And then look at this. I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue His work. Now, remember... We need to focus inward where we are open and honest with ourselves and open and honest with God. But we also need to focus upward and recognize that any progress we make in our spiritual walk is possible because of the mighty hand of God working through us. When we become a Christian, we make a basic commitment. We will follow God's direction. And God's going to keep up his end of the bargain by transforming our lives. What allows God, God's a gentleman, what allows God to transform our lives is our submission and obedience to God's word. Amen. My role in obedience is 
is important. We get that. But always remember this. It's God doing the work in me. And I want you to get this. Okay, guys? You can trust the process. You can trust the process. You can trust the process because of the one that's behind the process. In the Old Testament character, Joseph, we see both dreams and detours. Amen. He had this dream. I don't know that he fully comprehended all that it would entail, but it was a dream. But then here he is. He's got this dream, and then he ends up going down. <laughs> He's dreaming. He ends up in a pit to a prison and finally to a palace. That's a process, isn't it? But if you study Joseph's life, Anthony, if you watch him through that process of going from dreaming to, to pit to uh, 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 prison to uh, palace, if you watch all of that, Joseph remained faithful because he trusted the process. It's what we see in David's life. After David was anointed king, many people would expect he'd go straight to the throne room. But what did he do? He went back out taking care of his dad's sheep. Amen. David, I, I'm not going to get into this story. It's humorous. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and share it. <laughs> it, it was funny. I'm going to get myself in trouble. Uh, just everybody take her weapons away from her. Uh, <laughs> but it's so funny. Because I, I want to make sure <laughs> that I, when I'm preaching, I say words correctly. And one of the greatest apps I've got is I'm just going to, how do you pronounce? And you, uh, you type in, how do I pronounce? You put the word in. Now, I know some of you are going to think this is funny. Uh, but I want to make sure I was saying the word liar right. And I'm not talking about a person. I'm talking about an instrument. <laughs> liar. <laughs> Well, I'm sitting there in my, my chair. My wife's sitting over there in her chair. She's talking to me. I hit the button. Liar. <laughs> She'd say something to me. Liar. And all of a sudden, she accuses me. You're using that again. No, I'm not. I just want to make sure I'm saying it right. So I got it down, guys. David plays the liar. Now the Spirit of the Lord, 1 Samuel 16, beginning at four, verse 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the liar. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to the attendants, Find someone who plays Plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the liar. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers, messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David who is with the sheep. Listen now, it was while David uh, was tending the sheep that he developed his ability to play the liar and to write music. Now, I, this is an important point. I want you to get this. The preparation had to come before the opportunity. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Then you fast forward to the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, beginning at the 32nd verse. Uh, and David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him, struck him, delivered him out of his mouth. 
And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And look at what he says. And this uncircumcised Philistine is going to be like one of them. Again, preparation comes before the opportunity. A man shares how he was working on getting the under-the-cabinet lighting working again in his kitchen. It was one of those long fluorescent bulbs, and it was uh, over the sink where you could see if you get your dishes clean, and it w quit working. And the first thing he thought, well, it's a bulb issue. So he gets up and changes out the bulb, and I, no, it's not the bulb. He thinks, well, maybe it's a ballast problem. So he gets back up, takes the bulb, changes out the ballast, puts it all back together. Nope. Still not working. Uh, uh, so he, he, he discovers that the unit has an internal switch on it, and somehow it got turned off, so he turns it on. Still not working. He kept at it until he realized that the breaker had tripped. The issue wasn't in the kitchen. It was in the utility room. The problem what, uh, he thought was there at the light was really here in the utility room. Here's where the problem was. There's where the evidence of the problem was revealed. I want you to get this, guys. The, 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 the process is meant to help us to get it right in our here so we'll get it right in our there. Amen. Listen, it doesn't work out anywhere until you get it right in your here, where you're at. Amen. See, David wasn't perfect. He wasn't, guys. And how many of you, I've said this before, but how many of you are grateful that the Bible is not continuing to be written? I am so grateful that there is not a book of Charles Tate. I'm glad there's not one story of my life in the Bible. But David is out there. I mean, literally, the curtains are pulled back and we get the first-hand look at David's life. Amen. Now, there was one such incident in David's life recorded in 2 Samuel 11 when he, first of all, was in a place he shouldn't have been and looking at things he shouldn't have been looking at. Amen. And the thing of it is, he let his eyes stay on the object too long. And it consumed his thoughts. I, I know I've said this before, but I want you to hear me. You can't always control what your eyes see, but you can control how long you allow your eyes to stay. Amen. Now, I want you to get this. David failed himself. David failed others. And David failed God. David sinned. Amen. David sinned. David missed the mark, if you will, in his life. Now, what you need to know is that wasn't the end of his story or the end of his service. My God, I want somebody to hear me right now. Stuff's out there, guys. Stuff's out there that can tempt us, that can draw us, that can uh, cause us to focus on things we shouldn't be th focusing on, thinking about things we shouldn't be thinking about. They're out there. Come on. And sometimes it's just a thought that leads to sin. Hey, come on. Amen. But listen to me. So many times, and I'm so grateful that we are finally advancing enough within the church that that missing the mark, that sin, that transgression doesn't have to define the rest of our lives. Amen. He said, see, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan, Nathan, the prophet, confronts David about his transgression. Can I tell you, when somebody confronts sin in your life, it doesn't have to be combative. And that's the way we have looked at it. Somebody confronts me about something, they immediately assume a combative stance and begin to refuse and reject all. Come on, I'm doing okay, guys. 
Now, Nathan is real about it, confronts David about it. And listen, because David trusted the process and trusted God's role in the process, he knew what he needed to do and he did it. Amen. Remember our first point in living an empowered life. Our for, first point is focus inward. Be honest with yourself and honest with God. That's the first thing David had to do right here. He had to be with his honest. He had to own what he did. And when he owned what he did, read Psalm 51 sometime, guys. When you read Psalm 51, it's David's confession. It's David asking God, I know I messed up. I know I missed the mark. I know I sinned. But God, what I want you to do right now is create within me a clean heart. You haven't given up on me, God. I'm not going to give up on myself. I'm going to trust the process because, God, you want your best for my life. Amen. Amen. I dare ask anyone to raise your hand if you can say I've never messed up. Don't you do it. <laughs> Amen. But how quickly do we sometimes want to write ourselves off? When you do that, you're taking God's role out of the process away from him. Am I making sense today? Focus inward. Be honest with yourself and be honest with God. Second, the second point is this. Focus upward, acknowledging God's role in the process. 1 John 2 and 1, the New International Version. My dear children, I write this to you. Now, you've got to go back and read chapter 1. He's been writing to them, giving them insight, giving them instruction, giving them encouragement. And he says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. I want to give you some instruction. I want to give you some insight. I don't want you to sin. But it doesn't stop there, does it? But if anyone does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Hallelujah. Trust the process. Can I say something too? As a church family, we need to allow other people to trust the process and get it right with God. Yeah, maybe they did mess up. Maybe they did miss the mark. But that's not the end of their story. It doesn't have to be the end of their service. We need to make room for them to allow God's working in their life. Amen. I'm preaching okay today, guys. I want you to see this. I want you to see David allowing the process to work in his life. And I don't have it on the screen. I wish I had, but I, but I don't. But listen to this. It's a four-step process. First of all, he was confronted. How many know that God loves us enough when he sees us mess up, he's going to get in our face? He's going to do it because he loves us. Maybe it's through an individual or, or, or whatever, somehow, some way. God loves us so much that when he sees us mess up, he's going to get in our face, showing us he's not giving up on us. So the first step, he was confronted. The second, he was convicted. Convicted is not a bad word. It causes you to be real with yourself and with God. The third, he confessed. And the fourth, he was cleansed. Can somebody say, thank God for the process? Amen. See, again, when you get it right in your here, you're going to get it right in your there. And here's a point I want you to get. If you shortcut the process, you short-circuit the product. Amen. You can't shortcut the process. You've got to allow the process. He began the work. He's going to complete the work. I trust the, and, uh, the, God's role in the process. David prepared in his here so that he would be prepared for his there. He messed up. He did. But what did he do? He didn't uh, run from it. He didn't try to deny it. He owned it. And he is mentioned in the New Testament as being a man after God's own heart. Amen. 
Trust the process. It's in the process that preparation is taking us in a, uh, taking you to a place uh, that will enable you to step into the opportunities God has for you. Trust the process. So focus up inward where I'm honest with myself, with God. Focus upward where I acknowledge God's role in the process. Amen. I'm talking about an empowered life. These... These are not disconnected points. These are points meant to work in harmony. And there are times I've got to go back to previous points and replay them in my life. Amen. And here's the third one. Focus outward. Focus outward. Where I examine my true feelings for others. Amen. Over the years, there have been sports teams that have exceeded expectations. Nobody expected them to accomplish what they accomplished. They looked at them and said, yeah, there's some raw material there, but we just can't see them really going anywhere, and they end up going somewhere. They exceeded expectations. And listen, part of their success is due to an unselfish mindset adopted by coaches and players. It's literally a motto I believe summarizes best, and this is what the motto is. We're building a team, not collecting talent. Amen. We're building a team, not collecting talent. Amen. It's not about the individual. It's about the team. Amen. I've discovered, as many as you have, uh, that to accomplish what God has done or what God has in store for us, uh, we got to focus, focus on building relationships with each other, focusing together. And when we do that, we literally become one person the vision, one in the vision that God has for us. Amen? Listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verses 7 through 8. So, it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in, my, and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the t- tender compassion of Christ. What's Paul doing? Paul's building a team. He is not collecting individual talent. He's building a team. Amen? There is a unity that we share in as Christ's followers, not just because we believe the same thing, but because we're working together toward the same purpose. See, we have different ministries in here, but guys, listen to me. We may have different ministries in here, but we got to have one vision. We cannot have divided vision. Divided vision brings division. So we have different ministries, one vision. Paul said to the Philippians, I can say to you, you have a special place in my heart. We've shared together the blessings of God. We've defended the truth together, witnessed together. I love for you. I long for you. Listen, I think the problem many of us have is not that we don't feel that way towards each other, but that we have trouble expressing it. And sometimes, somebody say, preach. Sometimes, in the midst of our attempt to reach the goal, we unintentionally step over each other in the process. There comes a point where we find ourselves forgetting about the importance of others' ministries. And we begin to focus only on ours. Well, Carl, you you coached, helped coach uh, for a number of years. Listen, you know you're in trouble when you have a player that's more interested in their individual stats than they are the team stats. Because they're making it about them. 
Come on. Rather than recognizing everyone's contribution, we can even become jealous of the way God is working through other people. Amen. Can you imagine being on the same team? There'd be two wide receivers and one wide receiver, their stats are up, they're, they're uh, uh, seeming to get more passes, more yardage, whatever the case may be, and the other one is getting no attention, no focus whatsoever. Uh, can you see how the jealousy, instead of celebrating, come on. My God, let's get to the place we celebrate one another's victories in ministry for the team. Amen. Brother Harvey got to recently speak at the Martin Luther King uh, memorial celebration. I told him, I said, man, I'm proud of that. He got his picture on the front page. <laughs> he quoted him. He got a commercial. <laughs> what do you say? I'm saying, my God, if our heart's right with God... We're going to celebrate. Hmm. The last thing that we need is jealousy. Can I tell you what I believe is a healthy exercise that will help us all in this area? Go through the newsletter. Go through the newsletter. Look at the announcements. And begin praying for all the people you know involved in all the various ministries that are taking place around here. Amen. I want you to look around you on Sunday. Think about all the, the people invested in the music. All the, the, the people invested in the media and the streaming. Think about all of them. That's ministry, guys. Just begin to look around you on Sunday. Look at the newsletter. Read. See all the people that are involved there. Look around on Sunday. Consider, consider all that has taken place to make this a worshipful experience. How many understand that doesn't just happen? These guys on the worship team come up here sometimes 8, 8, 15, 8, 30 to get in here, go through the songs, get in sync, worship, because they want to be their best to give their best to the glory. Jonathan just doesn't show up on Sunday morning and say, God, fill my mouth. He spent preparation. He's been with God. People keep saying, boy, he's doing a tremendous... That doesn't just happen. You've got to put the time in. My God, somebody help me. Don't get jealous of one another. Celebrate. They're putting the time in. The work, my God. Think about it. Think about all those who are involved in ministering to our students, our children, those involved in small group, maintaining our building, those working on outreach, uh, those that are in a leadership position, those who teach, those that serve in some way here at the church. Just take some time and really think about it and listen. You begin to focus outward and you'll begin to thank God. Like Paul said, I thank God every time I think of you because I realize the contribution you're making to the team. Amen. Thank God. You're going to begin to realize the significance and the importance of the teammates. Can I take it a step further? Pray. Pray, pray, pray for them, pray for them that are engaged in the various ministries, amen? All the Bible studies, all the, the small groups, amen, from Women's Connection to Garage Guys to Hilltoppers to uh, all the groups that we have. I know, I'm, forgive me if I didn't call it out. I, I'm just doing it off the top of my head at this moment. But just think about those that are involved in those different ministries. And don't just thank God for them, but begin to pray, intercede for them. Amen. Can I just be honest with you? I feel like it's something I need to do more and more of in my own life. And I'm going to work on it 
there again, I've got to be honest with me and honest with God. And if I see an area of weak in, I want to get better at it. So I'm just saying right now, thank you to everyone that invests your time and your energy, your talents into making this thing work. <laughs> Whew. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to wear you out with it from now on. You're appreciated around here. You're a blessing. We can't do it without you. Amen. God's put a team together. And let's take... <sighs> I'm grateful for the team that God has placed me. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And I'll hurry through this last. Okay, I'll try to hurry. <laughs> this is important. Guys, this is so important. I'm talking about the empowered life, okay? We focus inward. Focus upward. Focus outward. And then we focus forward. Focus forward where I use my consecrated imagination for God's glory. See, I, I, as I'm thinking about you and I'm praying for you and letting you know how much I care, there's something else I need to do. I need to begin to focus forward using my imagination to see how God might use all of us together in the future. Isn't that exciting? Amen. You ever picture in your mind what the church is going to look like in five years or 10 years, 20 years, 50? What about 100 years from now if the Lord doesn't come? I'll be gone. But if the Lord doesn't come back, His work will still go forward. I want to use a my consecrated imagination to focus forward at all the possibilities that God has for us. Amen. I think about it all the time. I do. There are ministries that haven't even been born yet. Hmm. We're going to get closer together. Come on. We're going to love each other more deeply. We're going to lead more and more people to Jesus. Often I think of the different individuals here in our church, and as I see God working through them, I imagine how God might use them in the future. Amen. See, Paul did something similar to that church uh, at Philippi. He's, look at what he said again, Philippians 1 beginning at the ninth verse, look what he said. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you'll keep on growing in knowledge and understanding for I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day Christ returns. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. Paul's using his imagination, and he's praying for some very specific things he'd like uh, to, to see take place in their lives. He, listen, he dreams of their love overflowing, of their knowledge growing, them understanding what really matters, and living as Christ would want them to live. He clearly sees their lives being used in the future to bring glory to God. Look around you. You're seeing some people that haven't reached their potential yet. 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 Mm. See, I can look out at this group today and then begin to dream. Who would have ever thought garage guys would be like what it is today? Amen. Who ever thought women's connection? Who ever thought hilltop? Come on, guys. Who ever thought Thursday Bible study? Whatever it may be. Who would have ever thought group 12-2? You've got to be able to look out into the future. And no, it's possible. Who would have ever thought 
through, through the combined efforts and energy of ministry, we would be feeding people at Thanksgiving. And the, uh, we did that for two years. And then the next year, we not only fed at Thanksgiving, we were able to cu couple again ministry and, and feed uh, on Christmas Eve. My God, that's just the beginning of what God's wanting to do. Last thing you need to do is get jealous. Oh, yeah. mm. You know what I see? I see others building our church or our children into fully devoted followers of Christ. Others I see working on their musical talent and bringing glory to God. We've got musicians, Ryan. Probably haven't even picked up an instrument yet. But they're going to be playing music, leading in worship. Woo! You know what I see? We already see this through Ryan and Emily. Through their marriage works seminar. We've already talked to Ryan about another one this year. And that's in the planning stages, I believe, even now, the Spirit of God working. See, I see others developing mar marital skills and parenting skills. Can I tell you that's much needed ministry today? I see them growing in those, developing those, and they in turn are going to begin to teach others and mentor others in marital and parental. This is not to be theoretical. This is to be practical. Amen. Amen. Just simply being an example. Now you think I, I, I may be out there, but I, I literally can cl close my eyes and begin to imagine each one of us as individuals and collectively as a church. We're growing, we're building, we're maturing, we're becoming everything that God wants us to be. Devil, look out. Things are about to break free. Things are about to break loose. Amen. Listen, to focus forward is to picture things as they might be, praying toward the end as it brings glory to God. Yeah, we have had some setbacks, and we've just recently experienced another setback. But listen, we wouldn't even started building a new building on that property out there if we hadn't a vision of what God was able to do. But because we had a vision of what God can accomplish... Can I tell you something right now? The only reason I can go to bed and sleep at night with that building out there is because I know it's not mine, it's His work. We need to use our, our imaginations. Amen. What I'm asking you to do might be somewhat foreign. Those of us uh, in the evangelical tradition have often only been receptive to what we can see in black and white. But God is calling us to begin to see things through the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, the New Revised Standard. It says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us with unveiled faces seeing the glory of the Lord as, through, as though reflected in a mirror are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Listen, it is the Spirit-inspired seeing of Jesus. So, or we could say the use of our sanctified imaginations in the seeing of Jesus that changes our being and our circumstance. As we imagine His glory, we are being transformed into His likeness from one degree of glory to another. This, in essence, is how the fruit of the Spirit is produced in our lives. When we cease from striving in our own effort and yield to the Holy Spirit, when our faith ceases merely to be intellectual and rather becomes experiential and concrete our lives begin to reflect Christ's image and we, be, we see through our imaginations the glory of the Lord we're transformed into that glory it's what we see in our minds it's 
not how hard we try, how hard we strive that determines what we become. Amen. Throughout history, God's work through images that He has placed in our minds that allow us to picture who He is, what He does, and how He cares. And it is through the sanctified images of our imagination that God becomes more real to us than ever. It's not that I read about God and learn about God from that perspective, but now I not only read about Him, and uh, the Bible says He's a healer, but can I tell you through my years, He has healed me. So I don't read about Him being a healer. I know Him as my healer. I I know what it was to live and walk in darkness, and I read in Scripture that He is light, but now I know Him as the light of my life oh amen I read about him Jehovah Jireh God the provider I read about him Jehovah Shalom the God of peace I read about him in all those ways but now through the years I have begun to experience him and I know that just because scripture says he, I have experienced Jehovah Jireh in my own life I have experienced Jehovah Shalom in my own life so I don't just re- read about him provider. I don't read about him peace. I know him as my provider. I know him as my peace. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. See, what I'm asking you to do is begin to take the time to imagine yourself with God and his loving arms around you, acknowledging you as his child. That's so big. I'm asking you to Picture yourself literally standing at the throne of the Father, Jesus sitting at the right hand as you offer him your petitions and prayers. Allow your mind to transport you back to the cross. See the drops of blood flowing down his body with every drop that hits the ground experiencing the reality of his sacrifice for you. And I'm also asking you to picture with beginning... Uh, Picture being with God at this very moment and imagining just what He has to say to you today. It's a matter of moving beyond simply reading the verses of the Bible and allowing the experience of God Himself to come in your mind and transform you. It's taking the idea of focus to another level where we fully expect God to move into our lives, transform us by doing so He's going to be glorified. Now, I want to clarify something. I know it's a, it's, a, it's a dangerous thing because it almost sounds as though I'm telling you to allow your minds to run wild. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is using our sanctified imaginations as they are in agreement with God's Word with what God has revealed about His nature, about His character, and then allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us through the images that God places within our minds. Long before we ever broke ground, I could see it. Amen. I could see it. When you do this, it's something that has the potential of taking your focus to a point that you've never been before. Again, Four areas or four points of focus. Focus inward, where I'm honest with myself and honest with God. Focus upward, where I acknowledge God's role in the process. Focus outward, where I say, these are my teammates. How much I love them and how much I care for them and how much we can accomplish together. And focus forward. Begin to understand God wants to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power of My God, amen. Pick the area that you feel as though you need the most help with and begin taking steps to work on that area of focus. Pastor, I need help with focusing inward. I need help with focusing upward. I need help with focusing outward. I need help with focusing forward. Whatever it may be, work on that area and let God help grow you in that area, amen. 
I want them that are helping me today with the uh, altar to come back. I want to go back to something today quickly, okay, guys? Because really, my first message is all this, is how the enemy can get in our, in our minds. There is a term today that a lot of people have struggled with over the years, but it's a real thing where people are having a crisis of doubt. Now, I know most of you may not be familiar with Jenny Allen, but Jenny Allen has written just a tremendous book, Get Out of Your Head. And it talks about the mental battle. And it talks about a time. She's a conference speaker. She leads if gatherings for women. I mean, she is well known, uh, held in high esteem. She's highly recognized. Jenny Allen wrote that book. And in that book, she talks about an 18, 19th month battle with mental health, darkness, depression. How the enemy got in her head. Louis Giglio uh, wrote a book, Don't Let the Devil Have a Place, or Don't Let the Devil Have a Seat at Your Table. Craig Groeschel wrote the book about uh, healing in the mind. So, friends, this is real today. The enemy wants to get in her head. And how many of you know, before you un even realize it, that you have given the devil a seat at your table <laughs> and you begin to listen to his lies. Amen. And uh, I was preaching a little bit last week, Ryan, about how the, the, we need to be honest with her and the mental health issues and the mental battles that we have. And we talked about pulling down strongholds. Remember out of uh, uh, when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, we talked about pulling down those strongholds, casting down arguments and imaginations, bringing them all into obedience to Christ. We talked about that last week. But Jenny Allen in her book, in part of that that she went through, there was a crisis of faith. She began to doubt she began to doubt God, doubt the existence of God, and here she has been a conference speaker. But, I, but, but when I talked about that a little bit, I had two, three people come to me and say, Pastor, thank you, you've helped me. Because we thought we were going to have to give up on ourselves because we were going through such a battle as that. Now, there'd be some people that just don't get it. If you don't get it, don't criticize that do. Amen. But people are sometimes go through that crisis of faith and they begin to doubt God, begin to doubt God's existence. And she said she went through all of that and that verse of Scripture where Paul wrote to Corinthians became a lifeline for her that she realized, I can fight back. Well, BJ after service, BJ Lampley came to me after service and I'd mentioned just a little section of Scripture from Psalm 23. And he said, you know, remember, Pastor, in Psalm 23, it talks about that the, uh, the shepherd anoints the, the, you anoint my head with oil. And, you, and, and he said, if you remember, and I said, you know what, now that you've said it, I remember reading this, I remember studying this, I just didn't, and I, I, I thought, man, I need to share this quickly. Why would the shepherd anoint the sheep's head with oil? The sheep, we know, would face various enemies, lions, bears, wolves. And again, that's something David knew a lot about, was all those external. But uh, he had the opportunity to understand that sheep face other enemies that we don't think too much about. Because these enemies are so small, these creatures can make a, a sheep's life miserable. Now, I did some research on this, and here are a few uh, of these smaller threats. The, they face the warble flies, the mosquitoes, the gnats, and something that's called the nasal fly. Sheep are troubled by those nose or nasal flies. These little f uh, flies buzz around the sheep's head attempting to lay eggs on the, the damp uh, membrane of the sheep's nose. And if they're successful, the eggs hatch in a few days and forms a small, slender, worm-like larva. They work their way up the sheep's uh, nasal passage into the sheep's head. It causes severe irritation to the sheep. And, and for relief from the pain, the sheep will often beat their heads against 
against a tree or, or rub uh, their heads against a rock just trying to find relief. Friends, I don't know if anybody can identify, but I've talked to people that have said, Pastor, I got stuff going around in my head. I feel like I'm beating my head against a rock. I've got these small things buzzing around in my head. They're irritating me. They're frustrating me. They're just slowly deteriorating me, causing me to deteriorate. So that's why the shepherd would anoint the sheep's head because the oil they used would prevent the flies from roosting and nesting and spreading. God, there are people in this house right now that need their heads anointed. That need, the, they've got that stuff whipping around, flying around, working against them. And they need victory today in Jesus' name. Now I want you to stand with us today. And I've focused this altar call. You're here today, friends. I've been there. I have been there where I've had that stuff. And can I just be real with you? Recently, with some of the things we faced with that new building, I've had stuff that has wanted to lay eggs in my head and give birth. There have been times, I'm going to get real with you, okay? There have been times that I have dreaded going to bed. I'd make myself stay up until I was totally exhausted. When I do that, I'd go in there and I'd lay down and I'd go to sleep, but without fail, and it's still happening, without fail, two, it's like it's built in, I wake up, two o'clock in the morning, two o'clock, and those thoughts are buzzing around in my head, and I say, no, no. Weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. And I'm going to pull down those things before they... And over the last two or three nights especially, now Ryan will testify to this because he knows me. He can call me at 5 o'clock in the morning, most mornings, and say, and I'm wide awake sitting in my chair reading my Bible. I'm an early riser, always have been. But Burtis... You know, I've been plagued with this. And I'm telling you, I'm just being transparent today, guys. But I know there's victory. I'm saying this because I know there's victory. You know what time I got up yesterday morning? Almost 7 o'clock. Now say, well, pastor, that ain't sleeping late. For me, when I've been used to waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning and doing battle that I rolled over and looked at the clock and it said uh, 6.53. I thought, whoop, <laughs> whoop. <laughs> Somebody can relate to exactly what I'm talking about right now. If you'll only acknowledge it and be real with yourself and honest with yourself and honest with God, God wants to help you. I didn't wake up this morning until 6. And somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It may not seem like much to you, but those that are battling like I have been, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There is a peace that passes all understanding. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hmm. Go to sleep and the wheels won't start, stop, or uh, go to sleep, wake up, and then the wheels won't stop turning. In Jesus' name, they're going to stop. You're going to be able to rest. Come to me, all that are heavy laden, burdened. I, I will give you rest. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God, today in Jesus' name. We're going to see victory today in people's lives and people's minds. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. They're going to begin to lead us in worship for a moment. You want to come to this altar and let us pray with you. Please, please come. Let us have the, 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 the opportunity to anoint you and to pray victory in your life today in Jesus. Come on, please, as they lead us out in worship.
everyone. My name is Darla, and we want to thank you for joining us online today. We pray that the sermon has blessed your heart and know that God has some great and mighty things for you. Anytime you would like to join us in person, we would welcome you. And we just want to thank you today and pray you have a great day. Thanks for watching, everybody. You can give online to brookportcog.com or to the address below. Thanks for being with us.